It feels wrong to say that my number one passion project has been to create a metagame as stupid as metronome free-for-alls. You know, the format where you have no control over the attacks you do. With four people needed to start a game too, this may as well be the Mario Party of competitive Pokémon. That's probably why it's so depressing how seriously it's taken by me and the council, who will argue to the core about why the Pokémon who rolls its toilet paper over is better than the one that rolls it under. This clearly means that I'm biased too, which is why you'll be hearing the opinions of the five other council members alongside my own, to hopefully show how up to interpretation the viability ranking is. The viability ranking being a combination of all of our opinions may make it sound like we're all satisfied with how it ended up too, but that's far from the case. Basically, I'm just going to say that this will be a very, very interesting video. I also want to thank Zero's Gal for making a spreadsheet with all the moves called by Metronome, as it was really helpful in the making of the video. As such, let's stop diddly daddling and get right to the point. That's what I'd say if I got sex, but unfortunately I have to educate you on a new clause that was implemented. Before we do that though, I'll list all of our old clauses on screen right now. They still apply, of course. If you want to know why they exist too, then you can check out our last video. That video is outdated though, as a result of the Pokémon Home compatibility update changing the metagame. It's probably a good thing that the update came too, as without it, I don't think we would have implemented our most important clause. Also, we added the metronome clause, so that way we can just ban non-metronome users instead of ditto. Anyway, the real clause that we added was the item clause. The item clause is easily the best balancing choice we've ever made. Sure, it didn't need to happen. Leftover spam was perfectly balanced, but forcing only one leftovers user on a team makes building significantly more involved, and opens up other options for offensive teams to actually be viable. As you'll see soon, the item clause will make or break many previously available Pokémon, and is going to be a huge factor in determining a Pokémon's viability. I'd be remiss to not mention any power creep though, as for the first time ever, we had bands of our own to make. Mewtwo, Calyrex Ice, and Calyrex Shadow were all automatically banned by Showdown itself, and we as the council were too scared to try unbanning them. Honestly, I'd be down to try testing them, although I'm not sure if it would have any positive effects on the metagame. Mewtwo would be insanely threatening due to having pressure as an ability, which would make up for its lack of bulk so hard that it would instantly become one of the tier's best Pokémon. Calyrex Ice would be insanely bulky with a Terra equipped, while also having unnerved to shut down tier staples like Arboliva, Gardevoir, and the various pickpocket users. Finally, Calyrex Shadow would be able to do what Calyrex Ice would while starting out with an incredible ghost typing that makes it immune to the most common attacks. Not only that, but both Grimne and Chilline would allow them to snowball like crazy. Of course, we don't know for sure if any of this is truly broken, but I'm sure you can understand why we all decided to just ignore them. Granted, I am forgetting about one new uber. An uber that's stronger than anything we've ever faced. Take it away, Spice. The mic is yours. There are three things I'd like to say that are guaranteed. Death, taxes, and my constant relationship with our Lord Mankey. From bestowing himself from the very beginning of Pokemon, Mankey's gone through nine long, vigorous journeys of Pokemon to become the greatest to ever set foot on a lowly metronome community, and it's through no fluke either. It seems to remain defiant beyond our misjudgments, and he uses his vital spirit to keep check of Pokemon such as Calyrex Ice and Shadow from ever becoming true threats to the tier. Furthermore, any non-believers of our overlord has caused Mankey in the past to be at his very anger point, allowing it to transform into TRUE Mankey, where every base stat becomes 300, and whoever acquires such a powerful foe automatically wins the game! I'm getting too carried away here, but Mankey's such an icon for our community, and there's a big reason why we give it all this love. Now back to you, Aids. Thank you for, uh, whatever the hell that was, Spice. <sighs> of all the Pokémon in the SVFFA Metronome metagame, Sloking Galar has come to avenge its outclassed Johto incestuous cousin. Out of all the Regenerator users, Sloking Galar has been unanimously considered to be the best Regenerator user for a few key reasons. The main one is an incredible poison typing, which allows for significantly more longevity than the water type versions of old. The reason for this is that it gives you a crucial immunity to the poison status condition, which wears down many of 
what would otherwise be the very best Pokémon. Sure, this doesn't seem too important when compared with Regenerator, but a huge appeal of Regenerator is that you can heal even when struggling. Lacking a Poison typing makes it insufficient in this role, a role that stall teams absolutely need. That's why Sloking Galar's best item is Heavy Duty Boots, since it allows it to guarantee this longevity, given how threatening hazards are to stall. If you don't care about hazards though, then you can run Shed Shell to prevent yourself from being trapped. You can also use Terra Ghost for this, but Shed Shell makes it so that you don't have to waste your Terra. I think Terra Ghost is better given how trapping isn't as threatening as hazard damage. Since players switch a lot to preserve PP, trapping moves end up only being effective if they're used by a Pokémon who doesn't switch like Ursaluna. To be fair though, Sloking Galar is so valuable that most players are willing to bite the bullet with their PP management just to kill it. Granted, there's also the concern of trapping moves only hitting you one third of the time since they don't affect all players in the same way that hazards do. There may be more trapping moves, and Shed Shell is certainly viable as a result, but I personally prefer the Bite the Bullet with Terra Ghost and go with Heavy Duty Boots. There's also Rocky Helmet, although I personally believe that Slowbro Galar outclasses it in this role. Black Sludge is another interesting option for it if you don't have a Poison type, although this isn't a very common situation. I think I forgot about the most important thing though, which are the stats that make this all possible. Sloking Galar is statistically a wall with a surprisingly powerful special attack stat. The special attack stat doesn't matter too much, but it prevents it from being a completely passive blob, which is a very solid trait to have. All in all, Sloking Galar is the defining Pokémon in the SVFFA Metronome metagame, and it's not even required. If that doesn't show how much cooler this metagame is than the pre-home meta, then I don't know what does. There was another new Pokémon to change the metagame though, and that's what gear Giratina 776 will be covering. Five Nights at Freddy's is a 2014 point and click survival horror game developed and published by Scott Corfin. The game takes place in a fictional family pizzeria called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, where the player takes the role of a security guard who must defend themselves from the restaurant's animatronic characters that become aggressive and homicidal at night. Ursaluna, with its 140 base attack, is much more homicidal than the animatronics, capable of dealing insane damage in the tier, making the bite of 87 seem like that of your toothless grandmother. Unlike other high attack mons, Arsalona has three things going for it. First of all, it is a normal type, giving it stab on the most common offensive type of normal. Secondly, it has great bulk with 130 HP alongside 105 defense and 80 special defense being massive within the tier. Finally, it has not one, not two, but three good abilities. The most obvious one is Unnerve, which is its most common ability, stopping opposing mons from using berries, which has become very common due to item claws. For example, our Beliver uses them on its harvest sets to become nigh immortal, or it used to before Ursaluna's stopped the Mon from being the best Pokemon in the tier. However, other Pokemon, such as Gardevoirs seeking to copy this harvest trick, or Tinkertons who use their pickpocket ability to try and steal another item, also get stopped by Unnerve. Cocaine Bear also gets Guts. You most likely have seen a video where a Guts Ursaluna can break through a Corviknight with a resisted facade. In this tier, we do not have anything as physically bulky as a Corviknight. Stab moves from Ursaluna will most likely break an opposing Pokemon in half, and this becomes all the more poignant if you use a Choice Band on your Ursaluna. Finally, Arsaluna gets Bulletproof, which is by far its worst ability, but is still great. It gives immunity to random moves like Bullet Seed and Aura Sphere, which are quite often super effective, and changes that super effectiveness to doing nothing, which is very useful for keeping your powerful bear alive. Overall, Arsaluna is the most consistent offensive mon in the tier, being great enough to find even a home on stall teams due to its unnerve. If you wish to terrestrialize this mon, although I do not recommend it, the usual best Terra type of Ghost works well on defensive teams, but you can also use Terra Normal if you're trying to boost its stabs to an absurd power. Slacking is a Pokemon that I've been slacking on. 
Kill me now, I deserve it. Granted, when something has the stats of my drunken uncle on Independence Day, it should have been clear that slacking wasn't slacking in any area. Why the fuck didn't you kill me? I think the only way you could be convinced is if I told you that its back sprite made him look like me when your mom. <sighs> I think this was the moment where we all understood how broken slacking was. When something so passionately beat its meat, it made us forgive its true want ability. In fact, let's talk about that. Truant is a genuinely amazing ability in this format, a statement that collectively made all of you do the poggers face. Well, that's if you're blind and didn't read my clickbait title. So the ability to give yourself twice the PP is insane. Not only does it use this to come for twice as long, but it also works because of how bulky this thing is, allowing you to stall out the entire metagame. In order to do this though, it needs support. Actually, it needs a lot of support. The first thing it needs is leftovers. Sure, this may be your most valuable item, but trust me when I say that giving it to slacking is 100% worth it. The next thing you need to put in your cum old cauldron, though, is some Terra Steel. Not only does it give you the most resistances in the tier, including a stealth rock resistance, but it also gives you an immunity to the poison status condition, which significantly increases its longevity. Sure, leftovers and Terra Steel may seem like a lot to get a Pokemon going, but slacking would have orgasmed anyway. The reason why is because if it gets given any ability other than Truant, then it becomes a terrifying offensive Pokemon akin to Ursaluna. Granted, on offensive teams, Ursaluna is usually better due to it being more immediately threatening and just as bulky. It's just to say that slacking isn't even that bad in this role. If you do want to bank on losing Truant though, then you can replace leftovers with Rocky Helmet or Choice Band for increased damage output. In fairness though, Ursaluna is so good that slacking has been relegated to its role on stall. Don't get me wrong though, this is an insanely strong role, but it does make it harder to slap on a team, even if you should never be slacking on it. I swear to god, how do you tolerate my humor? More tolerable than that is the Goat Harbaliva. Many say it has fallen off, but I just say that it's harder to fit. Instead of being a Pokemon you can slap on any team, it's now mainly a stall staple, although it can fit on quite a few balanced teams, being easier to slap than slacking at least. Harbaliva is a Pokemon with some incredible tools. The main one is Harvest, which allows it to continually heal back 25% of its health 50% of the time. Of course, this can screw you over if you're unlucky, but give Given how little you're hit in this metagame, the 50% chance is often tolerable. The biggest draw to Arboliva in the pre-home metagame was that if it was lucky enough, it would be unbreakable, being able to heal at a rate that no other Pokemon could. If you wanted to disrupt it, you'd need to use Ursarine, who was a good yet unspectacular Pokemon. Now though, we have Calyrex, who is about as scary as Magikarp. Yeah, I couldn't pull your leg for long. Ursaluna, being the second best Pokemon due simply to it being an incredible Pokemon, acted as the biggest roadblock Arboliva's ever faced. Given how easy it is to slap Ursaluna on a team too, it means that Arboliva has to be used after Ursaluna is defeated. This may seem like a complete knock against its viability, but I'd heavily disagree. Given how Ursaluna tends to not last all that long, it means that Arboliva is now relegated to being a late game threat. Hell, it doesn't even mind the other late game threats of Poltegeist and Gengar given how it heals back everything that struggles with its Citrus Berry. Granted, this is all to say that Arboliva is no longer the untouchable god of Metronome that it used to be. Offense teams can't afford Arboliva anymore, but stall teams absolutely need it due to how long it lasts on the field. Hell, if you're that scared of Vladimir Putin, you can stop shitting yourself thanks to Seed Sower. Seed Sower may heal your opponents alongside yourself, but the ability to heal your teammates often makes it worth using. It allows Arboliva to become more experimental with its item choices too, while not needing to run leftovers. The item we've chosen then is Lepaberry, since it allows it to outlast its opponents, making up for the fact that you'd be healing them. As such, it's not a bad set, but I still think that Harvest is better. That's just the ability and item though. If you want to run a Terra type, then Steel is where it's at. If you're running it on stall, then you may not be able to use Terra consistently, given how Slacky needs it far more than Arboliva does, but it is an option you can pull on balance teams. Or when your Slacky decides to die of alcohol poisoning and pull a Lunar Dance like a goddamn idiot. Traumatic experiences aside, Arboliva's stat spread is very similar to Slowking Galar's, and thank god for it too, as it keeps Arboliva as one of the very best Pokémon in the metagame, despite its throne being challenged for the very first time.
Shining Gardevoir looks like Rem from ReZero, and that will never not be fascinating to me. Amelia's best girl, by the way. Ignoring the fact that I have better taste in waifus than you, Gardevoir, just like ReZero, stands out by not only avoiding the title of mid, but by being genuinely excellent. How did this happen, though? Gardevoir wasn't even in the last video! Well, it only took one trait, that being the ability Trace, making every artist shake in their baby seal leather boots. Before the item clause metagame, Gardevoir was genuinely broken as a result of not only allowing stall teams to get both a second regenerator user, but also a second harvest user. To call that absurd would be an understatement. When the item clause came though, it became significantly worse, with Arboliva no longer being on every team and you no longer being able to pair Gardevoir with Arboliva, it made Gardevoir the second regenerator Pokemon and not much else. Don't get me wrong, this niche is amazing, but it's not the ban-worthy threat it used to be. Sure, harvest can still be traced if you're holding Citrus Berry on a non Arboliva team, or Lava Berry on an Arboliva team, but I think we should also describe the other abilities against mileage out of stealing. Competitive and defiant are niche, yet high value due to Gardevoir's low attack and competitive having awful distribution. Cursed Body can be annoying, as always. Magic Bounce gives it some extra security against status conditions. Magician and Pickpocket can help it get its item back from an opposing pickpocketer that stole its item, alongside potentially game-changing items like Leftovers. Poison Touch can cheese certain things, Sticky Hold makes sure that pickpocket users can't even steal an item from you, and finally, Truant can help it PP stall for a bit, even if its horrible bulk means that it will eventually have to switch out. Hell, Trace is so good that it knocked Azumarill and Metacham out of viability given how much Gardevoir got out of stealing their abilities. Albeit, Azumarill and Metacham were never great to begin with, that's beside my point though, as this ability is very good, even if the luck and matchup reliant nature of it keeps it out of the S rank with the other tier kings. Yes, this Gardevoir has a dick, a dick that's not even that large given how mediocre its stats are. It's because of this that it can be very easy to exploit. As for its typing, it's fine, just like its Terra selection. You're going to Terra steal like anything else, although I personally wouldn't recommend burning a Terra on Gardevoir. I said it better earlier, but Gardevoir, despite being excellent, isn't quite insane. Unlike Gardevoir, Tinkaton's been committing war crimes throughout the entire tier's lifetime. The main reason for this is that it has an insanely good steel typing. When paired with a fairy typing that gives it two immunities and every resistance imaginable, it manages to overshadow its mediocre stats by taking very little damage. The thing that truly propelled it to stardom, though, was Mold Breaker. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. Yeah, of course an ability that only beats Hadrian will be bad. Anyway, pickpocket is where it's at. This isn't a joke either, as this ability allows you to steal the opponent's item, something you can often do after using your own consumable item, like uh, Citrus Berry for example. It was predicted that the item clause would nerf this ability since you could no longer guarantee what item you'd steal, but it ended up not hampering its viability at all. The reason for this is that Pokemon are just as reliant on their items as they used to be. It's not like any item you'd steal would hamper you either. The only one that comes to mind is Eviolite, which barely matters anyway given how the power level is still too high for any pre-evolved Pokemon to be truly viable. Oh, I guess Flame Orb from Delphox and Ursaluna too, but it's also a niche item choice. Oh wait a second, I forgot about Black Sludge! I guess Pickpocket isn't good anymore. Just kidding! If you Terra Poison, then it can help negate the drawbacks of Black Sludge, if that is what you steal. It's kind of like Sloking Galar, where you don't want to be forced to Terra it, but have it as an option in case of emergency. In that case, Tinkaton, despite not having the most broken traits, is able to combine them all to become one of the tier's most reliable Pokémon. But now, I'll be handing over the mic to Torkin Peter to discuss yet another reliable Pokémon in SV FFA Metronome! Alolan Muck is a deeply fought Pokemon, with a single niche which can be stopped by 2-3 months on every team, but we still put it at rank 7. Why is that? This was because Alolan Muck has Poison Touch, which has a 40% chance to poison opposing ones if it hits them with a contact move, and poison is fucking scary. Being poisoned is one of the fastest methods to die in metronome battles, especially after item toss was added, which made leftovers a rare commodity. This meant that most mons need to bear the full force of the 12% per turn, and not even all poison immune Pokemon want to switch in against Mug. An example of this is Tinkatong, as a fierce pickpocketing 
black sludge. Another big positive it has in its favor is its typing. A combination of its poison and dark typing is one of the best types in the meta thanks to its many advantages, these being a psychic immunity in addition to four other huge resistances. The most important of these resistances is grass, as it's the fifth most common attacking type. Furthermore, it only has a single weakness being ground, which is tied as the eleventh most common attacking type. In addition to that, its poison typing makes it incapable of being poisoned, capable of using black sludge, which is the best item in the meta, being closely followed by leftovers, and lastly it can absorb toxic spikes. Although the last advantage is much less useful in the meta now as most teams already have a toxic spikes absorber with slow king Gala. Its typing is simply one of the best it could ever ask for. I would even say that it's so good that terrestrializing Mac Alola is a net negative, except in extremely niche cases where you are both pickpocket and are trapped and don't have a better target left, in which case Terra Ghost would be optimal. To finish talking about this month, it's that's okay. They are not the worst and not the best. It has 105 in HP, special defense and attack. By its physical defense, one of the most important stats in the meta is only 75, which hurts its longevity somewhat. Before I forget though, power of alchemy doesn't work in free falls. Spice! So in conclusion, alone mark is really scary, but an inconsistent one, as it is completely dependent on the opposing team not having many steel or poison types, and Iron Jesus needs to bless your metronome rolls to let you poison as many ones as possible. It's only safe from being completely inconsistent by its amazing typing, but talking about its inconsistencies just made me realize that we overwrote it a bit. Now, the only person with first luck in the Discord server, Girantina, please introduce the next Pokemon! There are a large number of moves in this format that blur as stat. So things like Sticky Webs, Defog, and a plethora of random level 3 mon moves which you throw away as soon as you get a 4th attack on your starter. Which can, are called re fairly regularly due to the sheer number. With Annihilate, each of these that hits you boosts your already great 115 attack up to unprecedented amounts, leading to a monster of a mon capable of destroying full health slackings in one shot. This ape is mighty indeed. Papa Nihil's typing is also stellar, being a ghost type, making it immune to two of the most common types, normal and fighting, with its other type giving it stab on fighting as well. With its great stats, 110 HP, 80 defense, 90 special defense, backing it up, Annihilate is truly a force to be reckoned with, whether given a defensive item like Leftovers or a Berry, or going full offense with Band or Mirror Hub to set up even further against a plethora of boosting moves which are thrown around, like No Retreat. You could even run pads. I wouldn't terror him at any point, not even to steal to prevent poisoning. Because Ghost Type is simply that good in this meta game, which Alka. Alcohol? We'll show with our next mom. Haha, ha. I get it. Cause Akla, my name. Akla. Sounds like alcohol. Very funny, Giratina. Very funny. Anyway, Poltergeist comes in near the tail end of the A1 tier, and there are many reasons for this mon being so high. The first of which is because it's of its access to the ability Cursed Body, which is one of the best abilities in this tier. This is because it has a 30% chance to disable an opponent's move when hit by a contact attack. In a tier where there is only one move on every Pokemon, this makes it a very strong ability, as it forces some opponents to struggle. Much like how I forced Yo Mama to struggle get in my- Poltergeist sets itself apart from all the other Cursed Body users because of its much better defensive stats, mediocre speed, and monstrous special attack. First of all, it has a slower speed than its main competitor Gengar which is a slight edge over it, as going first is typically seen as not as good as going last. It also has a higher defensive stats. On the physical side, it only has 5 points more than Gengar. However, this little bit can be very useful because of how common physical moves are. On the special side, it has a special defense of 114, which is huge. Even though special moves are not as common, when they do come out, you can be certain that you'll take them without you even having any investment allowing Poltergeist to move its EV somewhere else. My go-to is max HP and max defense, with a plus defense nature. But you can also drop the HP investment and instead go into special attack, making Poltergeist incredible, incredibly strong when using special moves. 
Damn. My pussy. <clears throat> Poltergeist also has the ghost typing. It is needless to say that this type is one of the best types in the tier because it's immune to both fighting and normal, which makes up many moves called by metronome. To be more specific, 22.75% of attacking moves called by metronome. You can also naturally switch out of trapping moves, which is important because being trapped by moves like Fire Spin or Whirlpool could be a death sentence for most Pokemon, but ghost types like Poltergeist can switch out freely without even having to Terra. The best thing about Poltergeist is that it's one of the best Pokemon to have in a late game 1v1. Saving Poltergeist for your last used Pokemon is an incredibly wise decision. You have a pretty large chance to straight up eliminate your opponent by making them struggle until they die. Bitch. Poltergeist's stats seem to be tailored really well for this tier. It basically has all the same stats as Gengar, but does it all better. With an incredible special attack and special defense, good enough speed, serviceable defense and HP, with an admittedly poor attack, but the other stats make up for this downside, makes its stats incredibly well-rounded. Items on this Pokemon are pretty narrow, the best ones being Leftovers or Rocky Helmet, but because other Pokemon want these items, you usually have to go for more niche options, like Healing Berries or Choice Specs. Poltergeist's Terra options are also pretty shallow, as it rarely wants to switch out of its type, but in case you're facing down a Poison Touch user, it's usually to go with Terra Poison or Steel. This all makes up for an incredibly impressive Pokemon that has a lot of game-to-game -game consistency. Now moving on to the person with some of the worst takes, most useless thoughts, and a admittedly terrifying but impressive femboy addiction, Torque on Peter. Now, when we talk about Tatooine, I need to bring up the obvious. You will not hear any horny jokes from me, as unlike AIDS, I am not a fairy. Although he vehemently disagrees with that, we all know it's the truth. Hatterweed is an interesting one. Its typing is not the best, being a fairy psychic type, but it's still good with an immunity to the admittedly second least common attacking type dragon, but you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. And a 4 times resistance to the tied first most common attacking type fighting helps its longevity, while its other resistance to psychic is an okay resistance. And even though having three weaknesses is not the best, at the very least, Tatooine can brag about not having a single weakness which is in the single digits in their commonality of attacking moves, while Steel and Ghost actually being the fourth and fifth least common attacking type respectively. While its typing is good, its stats are middling, especially its HP is only 57, making it less bulky than it wants to, while its defense stats are 95 for physical defense and 103 for special, which is okay but not enough to completely make up for its bad HP. On the other side, its offensive stats are okay. It has a respectable special attack stat of 146, and its physical attack is not bad with 95, which makes it work as an okay choice vex user. Even though the combination of its stats and typing is okay, the main draw to using Hatterene is its great ability, Magic Bounce, which reflects 77 individual set moves with the only set move it really doesn't want to reflect being Heal Pulls. And it doesn't care about reflecting the 6 sleep inducing moves or the 3 paralyzing moves it reflects. So it effectively reflects 67 moves it cares about. Even though the amount of moves it reflects is good, the most important sense moves it can reflect are spikes, toxic spikes, and stay fog. This is the most common way you see more than one layer of spikes happen. And although these hazards are rare, if they are set up on your field, it can often cripple your generator user. Slowbo is vulnerable to every hazard, the Galar twins or the Shrug of Toxic Spikes, and even Tornado Spherian hates Stay Frog. It should be noted that nearly every Pokemon is threatened by multiple spike layers. It's for this reason that having Hatterene ward these hazards off and increase the layers of hazards on the opponent field can be so game changing. The last thing which needs to be mentioned for Hatterene and hazard blocking is that it's a bad fit for Annihilate teams, as these are the only teams which care about the do nothing hazard Sticky Web. To abuse Hatterene's ability to its fullest, it can try to go full storm mode and use the precious leftovers to basically be guaranteed to live until you struggle. As even though its stats are not the best, its typing gives it just enough defensive capabilities. Or if you don't want to use this precious item on a one which could do nothing with these extra turns, you can just use the different healing berries. And lastly, for its cyber typing. Steel or poison to become immune to poison is good if you fear both it and poison dodgements, while terror ghost can also be good if you're trapped and don't want to sack your heterine. But in my opinion, using Terra on Hatterene is an easy case. 
but still acceptable if you have no mons that actually needs a terror. In conclusion, Hatterene is a solid mon which you can slap on most teams to stop hazards by still doing work even if no hazards are called because of its good typing and okay stats which makes it the perfect finisher for the A1 rank as even though it's not the best mon in any team side, it's still a good addition to most. Now, after four long tangents of other people from us the council, I have the honor of giving the mic back to the furry! You hopefully gave an abo it's been so long since you've heard my voice that you may have thought I went to grab some milk, but I was instead milking the titties of Slowbro Galar. Out of all the Regenerator users, Slowbro Galar is easily my second favorite. The reason why is because it keeps the defensive typing of Slow King Galar while having good offensive stats. This makes it a bulky offensive Pokemon with Regenerator, and easily makes it the best Regenerator user on offense teams. It's because of this that it forgoes lame stall items in favor of Rocky Helmet, which allows it to deal more damage while taking advantage of its natural bulk. Bulk that's especially important given its higher physical defense. On the topic of physical stats too, it's that higher attack that allows it to do its job even better, even if it's slightly weaker on the special side than Slow Kingalar. This is all to say that its defensive items aren't even that bad, even if they are outclassed to a point where you shouldn't use them. Slowbro Galar is a one-trick pony, but it's great at its trick, and you should stick to abusing it. Yeah, that's all I really had to say. Despite having a very legit reason to use it over Slow King Galar, it's not the type of thing I need to endlessly write about. So, let's move on. Since you heard Alcohol's take on Poltergeist, now you'll get to hear my take on Gengar. I'm glad I was the one who got to talk about it too, since I have a hot take to disperse. Gengar is not mid, and is just as good as Poltergeist, a fellow ghost type which shares its ability. This is for a few reasons. Firstly, its poison typing is huge. This allows it to keep the immunities of the ghost type while not getting worn down by poison damage and absorbing toxic spikes. It also resists 16 more attacks moves that can be called by metronome than poltergeist and acquires a quad resistance to poison, even if it has to attain the uncommon weaknesses to psychic and ground. The other benefit though is very important, and it has to do with the item clause. Now, poltergeist rarely likes leftovers, but often can't afford it without making its team worse. Gengar, meanwhile, can carry Black Sludge, an item in far lower demand. As such, I found Gengar to be easier to fit on a team. Sure, and its stats are worse than Poltergeist, so I'd generally rather use it if I could, but again, Gengar is so much easier to slap on a team. Hell, Gengar's not even bad because of its unique typing. This is a case where I genuinely don't know how the community found such a disparity between the two on the viability rankings. Outside of that though, there's nothing else for me to add. Anything that applies to Gengar also applies to Poltergeist, unlike our next Pokemon. Oh wow! The most biased person on the planet is talking about Lucario! If my YouTube PFP didn't make it obvious, Lucario is my favorite Pokemon of all time. And it's not because I'm a furry, I just think he's the pinnacle of a badass design. Sadly though, that badassery never translated well to the competitive scene. After a successful run in DPP and a two-time ban streak with its mega evolution, Lucario's been relegated to relative obscurity, but not anymore! In SVFFA Metronome, Lucario has a host of excellent traits. The main one is its Steel Typing, which is an excellent typing that's mainly relegated to the Terra slot, but Lucario starts with it. It also gets a 4 times Stealth Rock resistance out of its Fighting Typing, so it's not like that whole it back at all. Granted, everything I've said so far makes it sound very similar to Tinkaton, so what helps it stand out? Well, it's the excellent offensive stats it wields, letting it mix its offensive and defensive traits on offensive teams, akin to Slowbro Galar. Having a bulky centerpiece for such a team is incredibly important, and Lucario more than delivers on that front. Unlike Tinkaton though, it doesn't have the greatest selection of abilities. Steadfast is useless since speed is a completely irrelevant stat, and Inner Focus is useless since getting flinched is actually beneficial for PP restoration. As such, Lucario uses Justified, 
This ability is basically defiant at home. It doesn't activate as often, and the reward isn't as high. But when Lucario gets hit by that dark move, it becomes significantly scarier to deal with. Especially if you're lucky enough to get hit by a beat up. Alright though, if you didn't care about that, what's Lucario's items? Well, Leftovers is my personal favorite option. Which may sound like a surprise. Leftovers is a rare commodity, so you'd think that Lucario wouldn't have the privilege of using it. But on the high octane style of teams that it fits on, Lucario's role as one of your main bulky options is what makes it such a surprisingly applicable option for it. Granted, if you can't fit Leftovers, then I'd recommend Rocky Helmet and Expert Belt since they help bolster its offenses while not requiring offensive investment. Lucario is a bulky offensive Pokemon and not a pure offensive Juggernaut. Granted, if you're really at a loss for items, then I guess Choice Band and Choice Specs aren't completely unviable. I just wouldn't recommend them. To finish it all off though, we have Terra, to which Ghost is the best option by virtue of it giving you a trap immunity while also being the second best defensive typing. With everything said then, let's play a game of Smasher Pass! What do you think about Slowbro, Spice? Smash. <laughs> Whenever there's a king on a the throne, there is always a challenger. Whenever there's a King Charles I, there's always an Oliver Cromwell. This is most definitely not the right audience, but that's besides the point. Slowbro is more comparable to Dwayne The Rock Johnson for his defensive stats, making it capable of running Rocky Helmet efficiently, while still bolstering efficient special bulk to tank a multitude of hits. Rocky Helmet is also brilliant for Slowbro, because when a Pokemon is using the move Struggle, it takes an extra 6th of HP away from the Pokemon. This could be a fail to decide whether or not Regeneratormon can safely switch to Struggle or not. So TAKE THAT, Liberals! Your infinitely regenerating Slowking will never match the true power of blowjobs! Back on topic, whilst Poison type is more beneficial overall for something like Slowking Galar or Slowbro Galar, one of the benefits of being a Water type is that you resist an absolute shit kind of fire moves. Bigger still, let's play a drinking game. Why don't you join the Pokemon Lotus Discord server, play a single game of Metronome 3 for all of us, and take a shot every single time someone says that is a fire move. I swear on Mankey's life that you'll pass out by the end of the game. Furthermore, you're interceptable getting utterly ground pounded by something like Ursaluna because you're not weak to any stab ground type attacks. Overall, whilst a lot of council members have utterly disrespected this mon, making it only ranked at the bottom of A2, but don't sleep on his derpy boy, for he has the capability of kidnapping your entire family and swallowing them whole. Pass. I can't lie, I don't think Yuxi is a smash more by Pookie Bear Slowbro, but Yuxi is still one of the more interesting Pokemon that's been introduced thanks to Pokemon Home. Given its 130 base defense and special defense stats, it makes it more effective for being a wall. And whilst the rest of the stats Yuxi has makes you wonder why the fuck does Monza know you? Well, that's thanks to its ever so powerful Levitate. What does Levitate do? Levitate prevents a weirdly high number of things from going on, whether that will be you're immune to spikes, toxic spikes, or sticky web. But, you're also immune from ground type attacks, thus making it a fairly solid mod to switch into Earth Luna thanks to that combination. Furthermore, a pure Psychic Titan, whilst not being great on paper, does help to resist fighting type moves, the tied third most common offensive type in the game. Another interesting part about it is that the best item for it is Covert Cloak, being one of the only Pokemon viable enough to use the item. The idea of not receiving effects such as secondary status conditions, flinching, and other shenanigans helps to make it not be completely bullshitted to death whilst maintaining its thorough bulk overall. Leftovers also works, but that's boring as fuck. Now, what other things does Yuxi do? First of all, your mum, but second of all, would you like to have no weaknesses for some funny reason? Terra Electric. I don't know what you'd do with that information, but I'd just like to throw it out there in case you thought every Pokemon in the tier also had Wonder Guard for some reason. I mean, Shedinger would be a funny one if it had Metronome, but that's besides the point. Overall, Yuxi is a fairly solid mum with his defensive capabilities, and it could help a stall team out in a positive way. Moving on to our favourite furry creator, let's play this again. What are we saying about Delphox? Smash or pass aids? Pass. I tried so hard to rub my dick out to Delphox, but it just couldn't work. I tried for several hours to bust a nut, but to no avail. I didn't even get hard. Now, for the first time ever, I'm sad that I'm not a furry. Brakeson's kinda hot though. Huh? Oh wait, you want me to talk about SV FFA Metronome? Sorry, I was too busy beating my meat. Well, I guess I gotta leave this fap unfinished. God, I hate the fact that I have to edit such a long video. Granted, my horrible introduction only added on to that. 
Okay, so why would you use Delphox and SVFFA metronome? No clue, but wanna see a magic trick? Delphox can go abracadabra, halakazam, and make your item disappear as this ability magician runs in a very similar vein to pickpocket, but without the essence of requiring contact to be active. That's not all too relevant, however. What truly matters is that it's a special attacker, which really helps it stand out among item stealers. It also has the completely unique fire typing, one which allows it to use the surprisingly common stab it wields, while also being immune to the very frustrating burn. I think these traits are enough to make it stand out on its own, despite its admittedly meager bulk and poor physical offenses. Granted, the council member Flanders found an extremely unique reason to run it, utilizing flame or to bait opposing pickpocket users into a burn before stealing something itself. I think the set is pretty bad given how ultra-specific the circumstances to make it work are, but it is an interesting idea that Flanders continues to defend to no end. But yeah, there isn't too much else to discuss. Terra Poison is obviously a necessity for it, but outside of that, I'll let you hear our first words from Flanders himself. So, let's continue our game of Smasher Pass. What you smash iron hands? Uh, let's not go there. Moving on from Smasher Pass shenanigans, we come to a Pokemon that could smash your horny parts to pieces at a moment's notice. The three Paradox Pokemon had it rough in the early Metronome meta, being largely unexplored due to their middling typings and effective lack of an ability. But Iron Hands has risen from those struggles to become a real OU force, even in direct competition with a meta-defining threat in Ursaluna. But how has it managed this, and why am I simping for it like it's a fucking VTuber? Well, for one thing, Item Claws has been a blessing for it. Now that team builders have to actually get creative with their sets instead of slapping leftovers on everything like a fucking GSC player, Previously, low-value items are becoming more useful, and this includes booster energy, allowing our yellow and silver-bellied friend to harness its potentially great quark drive ability. Single-use consumable buffs normally aren't great in Metronome, where frequent switches are key to preserving precious PP. But the bulky offense and hyper-offense teams Mr. Hands calls home generally prefer to deplete their opponent's HP before they get the chance to use a PP advantage, and it serves a great role in those teams as a late-game cleaner. While it can't match Ursaluna for sheer power despite equal attack stats due to its lack of normal stab and further boosting options like Guts, Iron Hands distinguishes itself by leaning into the bulky part of Bulky Attacker. It has higher defense and HP than the Fazbear Menace, and with full investment in booster energy it reaches a ridiculous 450 defense stat, eclipsing even Diancie, who has the highest natural defense in the metagame. The Handyman's playstyle generally involves preserving itself early, and then taking the field at full health as the last or second to last Pokemon on your team and murdering as much as possible. Its regular offenses are great, as already mentioned, and if it manages to roll a useful boosting move like Swords Dance or No Retreat, someone is getting their ass handed to them. Terra Steel is still a good option for Iron Hands, since being immune to a potential poison timer always helps when you're trying to convert all 16 of your PP to massive damage and KOs. However, I actually recommend Terra Fire on him, since being burned is arguably worse for it than being poisoned due to the crippled damage output. You still get a good suite of resistances, and the Stealth Rock weakness isn't an issue if you're not planning to switch it around after Terra anyway. Overall, Iron Hands is a phenomenal Pokémon, and it's a shining example of the diamonds that have emerged from the rough as a result of metagame refinement. Speaking of refinement, time to give the floor back to a man who has absolutely none. Take it away, Aiden. God damn, I'm sad I can't keep the Smasher Pass train going. Granted, I'm not enough of a degenerate to run a train through all these Pokémon. I think Mesprit's a good example of that. Mesprit is very similar to Yuxi, and I'd argue that it's better. Of course, Yuxi has more bulk, but I think Mesprit makes up for that in its consistency. It's still rather bulky too, actually having slightly higher HP while not wasting as many of its points in speed, so the extra boost to its attacking stats feel more than worth it to me. Granted, I'd argue that the choice between Mesprit and Yuxi is entirely up to preference, as they play basically the same. Yeah, you heard everything about it already. Any options regarding item choices and Terra are exactly the same as they are with Yuxi. There's genuinely nothing left for me to add here. Surprisingly though, I do have a lot to say about Muck. I think Muck is severely underrated. For one thing, Muck spelled backwards is demonetization word. Isn't that funny? You should laugh immediately. Jokes aside, what makes Muck unique over its Alolan form is Sticky Hold, the same thing I do to my- SHUT THE FUCK UP! Given just how valuable Black Sludge is to its users, the idea of the item being taken from you is a sight so horrifying that not even being cucked could compare. As such, being able to find protection in that is incredibly important, while also being significantly more consistent than Poison Touch. Given how valuable items are in this format and how common pickpocket is, a Pokémon with the ability to just sit on an item thief 
leaf litter, like their your Hatsune Miku body pillow, is hugely valuable. Less valuable, though, is the lack of a secondary dark typing, which makes Muck less consistent of a hit taker. It keeps Muck Alola's stats, though, so it's not like it's bad at taking hits, a fact that matters even more because you don't need to worry about losing your Black Sludge. That's the thing, though. Since Black Sludge can never be stolen or removed, Muck absolutely cannot Terra except to gain stronger stab and Terra poison. This, however, could be seen as a strength for Muck, as many Pokemon are already fighting for the Terra slot as is. Not having to worry about that honestly makes your team more flexible overall. As such, I've grown to like Muck a lot. Since I seem to be the only one willing to die on this hill though, I'm going to drink some alcohol while our fellow council member Alcohol talks about the most mid-regenerator user. First off, Tornadus Therian is not mid. It is indeed very awesome and sexy. Second off, my name is not Alcohol. Tornadus Therian has been shown to be one of the most underwhelming new home drops. When it was announced that it would be part of the drops, I thought it would be one of the most threatening Pokemon, but it was sadly outclassed by the other regenerators. It also happens to be the sexiest regenerator by far, with its incredible mustache wings that you know can hold you and treat you with love and care, and it also definitely- Sorry, my parents walked in and expressed how disappointed they were with me. Now, back to Tornadus. Firstly, let's talk about the good. This Pokemon has the highest base stat total by far over the other Regenerator Mons. However, its stats are distributed horribly for this tier. It dumps so much of its stats into speed, which is not really something it wants. It really doesn't make a difference in most games, and when it does, it's a disadvantage. However, its offensive stats are where it shines. It is the best out of any Regenerator Mon. It has the highest physical attack, tied with Slow Bro Galar and it also has the highest special attack out of any Regenerator Mon, tied with Slow King Galar. This means that no matter what attack it uses, it will do a lot. It also has respectable bulk. Although mostly worse than all the Regenerators, it still usually doesn't have a problem going through all of its metronome PP. Its typing sets it apart from every other Regenerator. Flying is pretty good defensively, because its weaknesses are fairly uncommon, and its resistances are somewhat common. However, it is not immune to the poison status, which makes it fear top threats like Muck and is incredibly scared of the extra chip that poison gives. The flying type is also useful because it has a natural spikes immunity. Although it has a devastating weakness to Stealth Rock, that can be overcome with Terra Steel, but that comes at the cost of no longer being spikes immune. See the conundrum here? But that's not even it. Tornadus also wants to run Terra Ghost, so you can't be trapped in and killed by moves like Fire Spin and Whirlpool. Items are thankfully rather straightforward, and there are two good options depending on your Terra. Shed Shell or Rocky Helmet if you're running Terra Steel, and only Heavy Duty Boots if you're running Heavy if you're running Terra Ghost. If you have the right set in the game, Tornadus Therian can be incredibly dangerous, but it lacks the consistency of other regenerators. Now time for the person who lives in the single worst place on the planet. While I want to say the exact IP address. I can't. Let's just say it's a place with a large portion of the west coast of the United States of America that lives in constant smog. Please welcome Flank Steak. What's up? What? Dude, don't just expose me like that. If people know I'm from California, it'll completely kill my credibility. Oh, shit. My mic's on already. Okay. Anyway, while it's only just skirting the edge of a proper OU placement for a reason, Mew is still an incredibly cool Pokemon that earns its place on a metronome team by doing something entirely unique. In a tier where status conditions are one of the few consistent, no-nonsense sources of damage, Mew is an unparalleled status spreader. Thanks to the four-player nature of the FFA format, a status that Mew gets can be copied across all three opponents instead of just one with its synchronizability. This turns what's normally a bit of a mediocre ability into a real menace, and it gives Mew some amazing potential to force unfavorable trades with burns and poison, spreading passive damage like it's the virus which cannot be named. The threat potential of Synchronize gives Mew an undeniably scary field presence, forcing your opponents to reconsider who they want in battle at a given stage of the game. It's not totally impotent outside of this single trick, either. Not only can Mew perform that same trick twice with its trusty Lumberry, but it also tanks significantly more hits than you'd expect from something that looks like a baby Bingus thanks to its solid 100 of everything stat spread. This staying power is what lets it outclass Gardevoir as a synchronized user, since Gardevoir relies on its other ability, Trace, to have any semblance of longevity. That stat spread also allows it to attack with fairly consistent, if unspectacular, damage. But like I said, Mew is among the lowest ranked OU Pokémon for a reason. 
While its natural bulk is indeed good, that pure psychic typing isn't exactly padding it out with resistances. You also have to keep in mind that Mew can spread paralysis with Synchronize, as well as Poison and Burn, which sucks when most of the tier loves being paralyzed. Mew actually likes to run Terra Electric to patch up that problem, making it immune to paralysis and ensuring that you'll spread a useful ailment if there's nothing else you need to spend the Terra on. But even then, the value of pulling off a Synchronize can still be limited. If you get poisoned while an opposing Poison type is around, for example, they'll give exactly zero shits about it. So a Mew can be inconsistent, yes, and there is counterplay to it baked into most teams. But that same inconsistency means no single form of counterplay is foolproof, and at the end of the day, there's nothing more satisfying than getting a clutch triple poison, or putting your last phone a decisive timer in the endgame. Mew is clutch, Mew is love, and Mew is life. Not sure I can say the same for our next mon, though. Aiden? Of all the pickpocket users, I think Grimmsnarl is the most difficult to fit on the team. Its defensive profile isn't as useful for the meta as Tinkatons or Dalfoxes, and it's not any bulkier than they are either. Granted, it still has good typing, with few relevant weaknesses. However, several metronome players still appreciate it for a couple of reasons, chief among which is its excellent 120 attack stat. This makes Grimmsnarl a lot more directly threatening than the other two item thieves, which gives it a good niche on more damage focused type or offense teams. This can also be helpful because physical attacks are much more common than special attacks, which has led some players to even prefer it over Delphox. For items, it mostly uses the same stuff as the others, some kind of berry, a mental herb, or even no item at all for a more instant threat. Terra Poison helps it use stolen black sludge, and that's mostly all you need to know. Mostly. The second reason why some players like Grimmsnarl so much is its potential to mix things up with its other abilities, which, despite their gimmicky nature, have real use cases that are good to keep in mind. Prankster, despite its inconsistency due to the several viable dark types in OU, is a cool option for Grimmsnarl, whose frailty means getting one more metronome off before a fatal hit could be game-changing with some luck. Frisk is also fun if you want to use Grimmsnarl as a lead, since scouting items on certain Pokémon with high item variety can be great for playing around those threats in the early game. However, both of these have a lot of opportunity cost given how valuable Pickpocket is. For Frisk in particular, it's not even all that hard to just guess an opponent's item, so I wouldn't recommend that despite it honestly sounding really cool. Overall, Grimmsnarl certainly warrants its spot in OU, even if it won't be seen nearly as often as what's above it. In that case then, let's move on to the Pokémon that weren't quite as fortunate as Grimmsnarl, the C-Rank, a group with dubious viability and no OU tiering status. We'll still cover any niche they have, or claim to have, in OU, but it's also worth mentioning how they're faring in the early stages of UU. Weavile fell off so hard you'd think it was my parents' marriage. Before Pokémon Home came out and the meta developed further, it was actually quite solid, but offensive power creep means it's a joke now. While Pressure is still arguably the best ability in the entire metagame, it's really just a broken ability with an unviable Pokémon strapped to it. The main reason Weavile is such a headache is that it's a Terra Hog, which severely holds it back. Dark Ice is a defensive typing so bad that you'd think it was a practical joke in the same vein as Regigigas. As broken as pressure is, Weavile is simply too frail and has too many weaknesses to abuse pressure without wasting your Terra slot. This is often too big of a gamble to be worth it in most cases. Like, Mew is a great ability paired with a mediocrely tight Pokémon as well, but at least Mew has some great bulk. Meanwhile, Weavile's stats look like my GPA, and they wonder why I make YouTube videos instead of pursuing higher education. Okay, <sighs> They're not that bad, but Dark Ice still makes you weak to what feels like everything. Now, going Terra Steel is often enough to patch up that hole in its bulk, especially with investment, but is it worth using Weavile for? In certain cases, yes, since it forces stall mains like me to actually play the game, but I'd still generally argue no, as I think Slacking plays with its PP significantly better than Weavile, while also being a Terra Hog. In that case, can I find a niche with Pickpocket? Not an OU, since there are so many great item thieves there, but it's shown potential for that in the very, very early stages of UU. Granted, you still want to use pressure most of the time, and it has heavy competition with Tankatuff of all things, but either way, Weavile is still showing great promise as a potential lower tier staple. Okay though, we forgot about its items. What does it run there? Well. I find HP berries to be the most consistent, given how Weavile is going to die to a Mega Beedrill bubble anyhow, oh, but Leftovers is better if you can consistently afford a Terra with it on a game-to-game -game basis, but like, 
don't, don't, don't put that effort into it, especially given how difficult it already is to run leftovers. So, Weavile fell off, but at least it's not awful. Alright, now this is where things are gonna get heated, as I think Iron Valiant is underrated. Now, half the council actually agrees with me on that, but Spice dragged it down here all the way by himself because he's a deranged Mankey worshipper. Like, Jesus Herald Christ! Iron Valiant didn't kill your family! Calm the fuck down! Oh yeah? Take the fight, you fucking Granted, I don't think Iron Valiant even nears making a viability, which now means that Spice cannot disagree with the rest of what I'll be saying. What makes Iron Valiant good is that it's an offensive Pokemon with consistency. This is especially good since the item clause has generally made teams frailer. As such, Iron Valiant really loves being able to take advantage of that. Sure, 130 attack and 120 special attack aren't literally the greatest offensive stats in the tier, but they're made good by the fact that they're combined together. No other Pokemon has the capacity to attack in both spectrums to the extent that Iron Valiant can. Sure, there's Lucario, but Lucario is mainly used for its steel typing, with its mixed attacking presence being more of a bonus, if anything. With Iron Valiant, it is the main reason to use it. It's a big reason to use it too, as while Ursaluna has an awful special attack stat, meaning that it'll sometimes hit like a wet noodle, Iron Valiant suffers from an unambiguously worse weakness. That weakness is its lack of longevity. Since you're not investing in its defenses, it isn't very bulky, and its typing isn't exactly great either. Even if Ursaluna's special attacks aren't strong, it can't take enough hits for that to not matter. Granted, Iron Valiant is consistent enough in its damage output to make back what it cost. Sure, you'll never use it over Ursaluna, but as a partner to it, I think it's an exceptional Pokemon on hyper offense teams, and I wish I used it more to prove Spice wrong. In fact, we're still missing another point in its favor, and that is not either a Terra or Item Hog. Since it's so frail, you'll never be using it for Terra. Although, I guess Steel is the best option by default. As for items, it's extremely flexible. Its best item is Choice Band, although that can be hard to fit. Which means that Choice Specs will be used more often. If you can't even fit that though, then Booster Energy is plenty useful to boost either offensive stat. All of these items fit it like a glove, which means that building a team around Iron Valiant almost never feels restricting. In that case, you use Iron Valiant on fast-paced offensive teams that can make up for its weaknesses, as I think it's a Pokemon that should have been ranked in OU. Granted, it's not like it'll be broken in UU. Even though it fits the OU metagame very well, its poor bulk is a big enough issue for it to not be tearing up UU. This isn't even a slight against Iron Valiant though, as I could easily make this argument about every other Pokemon ranked in OU. Oh, most of them. Again, I'm quite good with hyperbole because I WANNA PROVE MY FUCKING BOY! So yeah, that's my hot take. Iron Valiant is genuinely good! I don't care how many times I have to teach you to say it. Iron Valiant is mid! I repeat it, mid! Dog shit! Complete, utter fucking garbage, man! AIDS, might I remind you you're in fucking Delulu land? Because Iron Valiant is mid! There is no other way of putting it! I'll fucking fight you, lad! Iron Valiant is mid! Alright, now let's continue with the hot takes. Not only do I think Toxtricity is underrated, but I think it's genuinely incredible, to the point where I underrated it in my own personal viability ranking, a ranking that put it higher than anyone else. Toxtricity is the definition of a late bloomer, as its traits weren't properly utilized until we made our final viability rankings. I, however, have the objective best takes of the council, so you can trust me here. Basically, what makes Toxtricity good is that it's a poison-type Lucario. Given how Gengar already set the standard for making this argument sound, well, sound, I think that alone should be enough reason to rank Toxtricity OU. Granted, it'll be a little harder to argue since, just like Gengar, it is statistically worse than its non-poison type alternative. Basically, it trades having slightly better HP for worse attack, which limits its mixed attacking presence more. Granted, I think this mix of defense and offense still makes it good. 
Just like Lucario 2, this makes it extremely versatile in terms of item choices. Black Sludge, Choice Band, Choice Specs, and Expert Belt are all good options for previously mentioned reasons. Granted, it can't abuse Rocky Helmet as well, since Poison is a worse typing than Steel. This generally means that it won't be your first choice over Lucario, but since Black Sludge is a lot easier to put on a team than Leftovers, I think it makes Toxtricity's niche very valid. There's also the point of using Lucario's Terra type and Ghost, but I surely don't need to explain why that is at this rate. In that case, let's finally bring up the main reason to use Toxtricity. Yes, we haven't even gotten to the main selling point, and I was still forced to see this thing be disgracefully shouted to Yu Yu. That selling point, then, is Technician. Technician is an ability that increases the power of moves with 60 base power or below by 1.5 times. Given how many metronome moves are that weak, it means that you'll be getting a Technician boost on about one-fifth of your attacks. This turns all the weak attacks into attacks that stain less to get. This increases the reason to use Toxtricity, as it becomes even more consistent in its damage output. This is the reason why it can run Choice Band and Choice Specs even better than Lucario can. This ability alone makes Toxtricity more flexible than Lucario, even if we could still agree that Lucario is better. As such, I think Toxtricity should have been treated more like Gengar and less like Azelf. As for Diancy, I have no strong feelings on it. I think its niche was probably enough to be Yu-Yu, but I'm so unconfident in this that I'm honestly fine that it became Yu-Yu. What even is this niche then? Well, it's Clear Body. Clear Body is an ability that makes you immune to all stat changes, including ones inflicted through attacking moves, which is what separates it from Hatterene. It's been far more reliable in this specific role that makes Diancy worth using over it. Despite this, it's even more prone to being status than Hatterene is making Diancy a lot harder to use, especially since going for a Terra Steel isn't really worth it in Diancy's case. It sucks too because resisting normal is an excellent defensive trait. It also resists fire, which is very important. The rock typing isn't perfect though, as it comes with quite a lot of weaknesses, with the fairy type not really doing anything noteworthy for it outside of patching up a very important fighting weakness. Statistically, it's great too. Sure, its HP is low, but those defenses are insanely great, being the highest defenses in the tier, and it can pack a surprisingly potent punch too. Diancy really is a case where the only thing keeping it from OU is its typing. Well, that and the fact that its item choices are very limited. Sure, it abuses leftovers as well, but you typically can't fit them on it. Covert Cloak is also just kind of the item of all time. It's fine, as it will consistently help you, but running Covert Cloak over Hatterene is simply ridiculous. In that case, you can stretch for uses for it if you run Baberi Berry, which patches up its 4 times steel weakness. And yeah, in retrospect, Diancy just doesn't seem worth bringing to an OU team. It's simply too much work. Granted, its stats are high enough for it to be really good in Yu-Yu, so it at least has that going for it. As such, I leave Giratina to cover Tornadus. Tornadus is a Pokemon with a decent niche in tier. To be honest, there's no reason to run it over Annihilate. However, if you want a second Defiant or Mixed Attack on Hyper Offense teams, it's a great option. It has a better typing and ability than Iron Valiant. While not doing as much by pure stats, Defiant allows it to make up for it. It's a little obtuse to fit, but it has great offensive stats to guarantee it'll at least do some work. It fits on more bulky teams than Valiant, such as ones with Hatterene, and honestly, I think that makes it easier to fit as one of the extra Pokemon to add onto your Hyper Offense team. As for items, it pretty much the same deal as Annihilate, although you may think about using heavy duty boots due to its Stealth Rock weakness. Finally, we have the Terra typing we can use. But the Ghost type, as I've said before, is the best type in this format, thanks to its normal and fighting immunity, while not being weak to fire, the second most common type. Speaking of Ghost types, Alcohol is presenting another ghostly Pokemon next with Burnett. For the last time, my name is not Alcohol, and the next time I hear it, I will report all of you to human resources. Anyway, 
Bennett is a usable Pokemon because of it has the highest attack stat and of any metronome user that gets Cursed Body, with the same attack stat as Annihilate. This means that on average, it can do more damage than Gengar or Poltegeist, which seems great on paper. However, Cursed Body is already rare to set off. Most users prefer to have bulk over offensive stats. And while technically it has the best physical bulk out of the three metronome Cursed Body users, the difference is negligible. It only has four more base HP than Poltegeist with the exact same defense stat. In every other meaningful stat, it's completely outclassed by the other two. The items and Terra it viably uses are the same as Poltegeist, being Choice Band, Leftovers, Rocky Helmet, and Citrus Berry, and using Terra Steel exclusively. How did Ursarine end up in C rank? I've never seen anyone use this thing because there's literally no reason to when Ursaluna is as stupidly broken as it is. Well, that's a bit hyperbolic on my end. There is one reason to run Ursarine over Ursaluna, and that it can carry the very exclusive Eevee Light. This makes it bulkier than Ursaluna while also freeing up a choice band slot on your team. That, or you can pair it with Ursaluna. Doing this can either help you pressure Arboliva with two unnerved users, or it can make you feel more comfortable with running guts on your own Ursaluna. Since Ursarine's role is entirely defensive though, it can't afford guts in the same way that Ursaluna can. As for Terra types, you can go the route of Terra Steel, which is useful for the same reason as Ursaluna, but you can also opt for Terra Ghost. Since Ursarine is more optimized for Unnerve, it makes the ability to switch around Art Boliva incredibly valuable, with Terra Ghost guaranteeing that it can happen. Granted, with Arboliva no longer being required, and with some Arboliva running Seed Sower, Ursarine's niche as an unnerved user isn't nearly as flashy as it sounds. For as cool as its potential niche is, it's just in theory town because there's simply no room to fit it on a team. So, while I covered an overrated Pokemon, I'll now leave Flanders to cover an underrated one. Take it away. Welcome back to my little slice of the video. If you're getting tired of the other council members' terrible takes by this point, now you know how I've felt this entire time. Anyway, this next Pokémon has an OU niche that's just as evil as it is small. The last two Pokémon I covered were all about reliably dealing damage in interesting ways, so you might think I like to play offense. But, you've been tricked. I've been a sleeper agent for Big Stall this entire time! <laughs> Slackoth might be a horrible Pokémon, but it's the only metronome user with access to Truant besides its abusive father slacking. And if you've seen the title of this video, you probably already know where this is going. Slacking is already the slack king of PP stalling, I'm not sorry. And on the hardest of hardcore stall teams, Slackoth can be its partner in crime to a notoriously weird and surprisingly effective defensive core known as Sloth Stall, patent pending. With Eviolite, Slackoth doesn't exactly become bulky thanks to those abysmal based defensive stats, but it can take enough hits in combination with its solid typing to loaf around for a bit early in the game. Terra Ghost is also useful to avoid trapping, but Slackoth is only worth preserving with Terra if it's still at high health. But it shouldn't stay in forever anyway, it's best used when pivoting in combination with slacking, to aggressively snag an early PP advantage. With a cycle of metronome, loaf around, and switch out, the sloth duo can perform the unprecedented feat of only burning PP once every three turns. Of course, something this gloriously evil does have its drawbacks. Slackoff can't deal any kind of meaningful damage when it's on the field, and it gets worn down quickly due to its poor bulk, so it tends to be the first on its team to faint. As such, it's completely dead weight if your goal isn't to win by PP depletion, or if that goal isn't within reach for whatever reason. But it still has a much more solid and established OU niche than most of the C-ranked Pokémon, and that at least gives Slackoth something to be proud of. It truly has served Big Stall well. As for UU, its viability is uncertain. On the one hand, the power level of that tier is much lower, allowing it to actually feel bulky on occasion. But on the other hand, its stats are still so terrible that it might not be justifiable for use unless it's enabling a larger playstyle with dedicated partners, like it is in OU. UU also gives it the problem of several more viable non-fully evolved Pokémon that want its Eviolite. But speaking of unproven UU Pokémon, next we've got one that nobody wants to touch in the Team Builder, because it's just that boring. Aiden, go ahead. I really wanted to use Meloetta in this metagame, but it just didn't happen. For as cool as Serene Grace is for doubling the chances of alternate effects, it's simply not consistent enough for Meloetta to be worth using. Not every move has a secondary effect, not every secondary effect is impactful, and not every secondary effect is guaranteed to even trigger. Hell, you might not even want something like Body Slam to trigger Paralysis. When stated like that, Meloetta, honest to god, sounds more like a D rank Pokemon. I ranked it strangely high in the C rank on my personal viability ranking, and for that, I will admit my mistake. In that case, 
what is its saving grace? Well, that's its stats. Being decent physically and great specially, Meloetta will stick around. It can stick around even longer too if you're running Terra Steel on it, even if it obviously can almost never afford it. That's why on the item front, you're only really gonna give it choice specs, although you do have options like Covert Cloak and Citrus Berry too. Sure, it would be preferable to run leftovers, but don't even try to fit it in. It's not worth it. That sentence honestly describes Meloetta perfectly. It's a Pokemon with a cool trait that sadly is just not worth using. I guess that's also the best way to describe the upcoming D rank as well. I think I was too harsh towards Screamtail on my personal viability rankings. Sure, it's pretty passive, but it's also very bulky. Granted, the reason I passed over it is because it has to compete with Hatterene and Gardevoir who share its typing. They both simply have far better abilities. Granted, Screamtail does have a unique ability of its own. With Protosynthesis, it can hold a booster energy to boost one of its defenses to higher levels. Despite its obvious upsides, it discourages you from switching, which is a big weakness. The opponent can easily take advantage of this by switching in a Poison Touch or Curse Body user. That's why Slack Off is still better despite its worst stats, as it can fulfill its intended purpose without leaving itself exposed for a million turns in a row. But in Screamtail's case, there there's no other option, making it far more exploitable and far less flexible. Its stats may be good, but it has a lot stacked against it. But in Yu Yu, its competition is gone, and it's simply incredible there. Being so bulky makes it a great leftovers user, but the option for booster energy is still great for team building. So at the very least, Screamtail has a home somewhere. Well, with the Regenerator Clause in place, it was inevitable that one would be impossible to fit on a team. Sadly, that Pokémon is now Slowking. What was once the third best Pokémon is now D-Rank. Why? Because it literally has nothing over the other Regenerator users. It has more special defense than Slowbro, but given how Slowbro is already no longer the best Regenerator user, it makes it way too hard to justify using a worse version of it. It can't take the more common physical hits as well, while also not being able to abuse Rocky Helmet as well. Hell, Slowking Galar is a better special wall too, giving it even less reason to be used. Just don't use Slowking. It's not even that bad, it just, just, just don't use it! At the very least though, its lack of competition has made it UU's best Pokémon, and for that, I'm happy, I guess. Dragonite is dead, and the Item Claws killed it. While it used to be good in OU due to its ability to use Leftovers to repeatedly regain multi-scale, that niche died with the Item Claws. Leftovers is simply too exclusive of an item to fit on Dragonite, even though it needs it to stay viable. As such, it had to adapt becoming a mediocre choice band user. Okay, fine, it does still have a lot of good qualities. Its typing is really good, having resistances to the common fire, water, grass core is great. It's also immune to spikes, toxic spikes, and sticky web, even if it's negated by its stealth rock weakness, making Yuxi and Mesprit far better candidates for the role. That's the thing with Dragonite, it's not even that bad, it's just so hard to fit because everything seemingly outclasses it. Its stats are great, but I haven't even mentioned them because what's the damn point? I guess in that case, I can be glad that it's finally good in Yu Yu. There, it cemented itself as a top tier Pokemon thanks to the removal of other options that would prefer to run leftovers ahead of it. Leftovers and multi scale is one hell of a drug. Choice Band is still terrifying, coming off the highest attack stat in the tier as well, so thankfully Dragonite has found its niche. Also, Terra Steel, because I said so. Yes, I do know how to write a functional paragraph. Haunter is an interesting one. It has the same amazing typing as Gengar, with Poison Ghost, which is excellent for all the reasons already said. In addition to that, he is an NFE, which makes it possible to use Evilite instead of Black Sludge, which is excellent in a post item class meta as many other mons already are fighting over this item. But unlike Gengar, it doesn't have the best 1v1 ability Curse Body. Instead, it has the extremely interesting ability Levitate, which makes it immune to spikes, which is great as it allows your regenerate user to still use its ability without killing its teammates, but this immunity also means Haunter can't absorb toxic spikes. Even though the spike immunity is great, Levitate adds one more thing to Haunter's gate that is arguably even better, an immunity to ground, one of the weaknesses of its typing. This makes it one of the two months in a tier with a triple immunity, the other being Sableye. The last thing that needs to be mentioned about its ability is that everyone alive has a 0.1A chance to call gravity with Metronome, which invalidates the ability for 5 turns. 
Now that we finished talking about the things which make Honda okay, I need to talk about the reason Honda is giving. It's that Honda's work is non-existent, with an HP and defense stat of 45 and special defense of 55. These stats are so bad that even with an evil light it still is frail, especially as it has no way to recover its HP. In addition to that, its physical attack stat is not good, sitting at 50. While its only okay stat is special attack, which sits at a respectable 115. Lastly, we need to talk about its terror typing. Don't use terror on Haunter. Its typing is already one of the best. In conclusion, Haunter isn't one with some unique traits. However, they are mostly invalidated by its bad stats. Berserker is like Lucario, but mid! It has higher defense, but that's it really. It doesn't even have a cool ability. Sure, Tough Claws is good, but like, why would you run that over Lucario? I guess it technically abuses Rocky Helmet better, but again, why would you run that over Lucario? Sadly, Berserker is like Slowking. It's not even that bad, but like, why would you use it? At least it's good in Yu Yu though. I guess. Oh wow, I repeated something I said earlier because I've gone too insane writing this insanely massive fucking script for me to give a shit about anything anymore! SOMEONE END MY FUCKING SUFFERING! Ah! Wait a second. It seems like Flanders is here to help. Give an analysis on Shanzi that's so good that I'll be able to come to it 45 times a day! Ah! I can't believe he left that in the script. Uh, say la vie. Anyway, Chansey is fat, and I'm here to fat shame it. Sure, it's done nothing of note in OU due to its total lack of offense and physical frailty, but I still hate its guts. Fuck this blank staring, egg toting, eviolite hogging, natural curing blob, and all the war crimes it's committed in UU. It's not even that good, anyone who uses it just seems to get amazing metronome luck. You can expect a chance user to constantly roll recovery moves whenever they need one, high power attacks that are super effective against whatever you're using, and never anything that actually hurts them while everyone else gets explosions and mementos left and right. I guess the luck thing is lore appropriate for Chansey, uh, but, st but still. Th its aforementioned flaws, alongside the fact that Eviolite has far more value in Yu-Yu, means it really shouldn't be that good. And yet it's gotten results somehow by sucking the fun out of every match it's in. Now excuse me while I go hunt them to Extinction and Scarlet and Violet for those sweet chunks of XP. And I believe you're scheduled to visit the monkey exhibit next with tour guide Torkin, so let's head over there real quick. Primeape is a twice outclassed mon with minimal advantages over the other options. It is a defiant mon, and we already have two better alternatives. Because of this, people are considering running Anger Point instead of Defiant, although I don't think it is worth it. But what reason do you even have to run Primeape? It has a mid-typing with pure fighting, which has some uncommon weaknesses with the 6th most common attacking type Psychic, the tight 11th, Flying, and the least common attacking type Fairy, while resisting the 5th most common attacking type Dark, the tight 11 Buck, and the 2nd least common attacking type Rock. If you add all those attacks together, it resists 4 more attacks than it is weak to. Like its typing, its stats are awesome mid. It has horrible bulk on both sides with an HP stat of 65, defense of 60, and special defense of 70. With these sets, it often dies before it can do much with its Defiant boost, and even in the case that it can abuse it, it is a worse abuser than its evolved from a Nihilape, as it has 105 attack, 10 less attack than a Nihilape, and will most likely run Evil Light instead of Choice Band. The only time it has an advantage over it is in its special attacking set, which sits at 70 instead of 60, but the change is so inconsequential that it doesn't need to be thought about. The one real advantage Primap has over the others is that in addition to the normal items used by Defiant users, it can run Evil Light. Although even with the defense boost, it still is too frail for the meta. Lastly, we need to talk about the terror typing, which can be ghost for the immunities or steel for the resistance and the poison immunity. In conclusion, Primap is a completely outclassed mod that you have no reason to run, and it's only in the VR because it was the face of hyper offense in the past. Now that I gave my opinion on this mod, Eds can get his bike back for the other D rank mods. I so badly wanted Palmot to be viable, but it just didn't happen. An offensive Pokemon that can ignore status with natural cure sounds amazing, but it's just held back by its stats. Its attack is good, but it's frail and its middling special attack doesn't give it a consistent damage output. Its typing isn't anything special either, even if it's not particularly bad. It's because of this that we've seen some minor innovation with a Volt Absorb set, but this didn't really hit the mark either. It sucks too because it has potential, but Palmot just 
isn't that good an SV metronome FFAOU, whatever the fuck it's called. God damn it, why the fuck did I slip it up? I'm gonna include it anyway because this is fucking Wigglytuff, on the other hand, is filled with potential. I saw it a couple of times and it was fine. Competitive, being special defiant, is honestly enough to justify Wigglytuff being far higher on this list. Granted, I wouldn't take it out of the D rank since it's stupidly hard to fit. It competes with Defiant users, it competes with other special attackers, and special attackers aren't even that good anyway. If Wigglytuff didn't have RU tier stats, then none of this would matter, but again, it has RU tier stats. But hey, being somewhat bulky at least makes it better than the other competitive user in Gothitel. Outside of that, I have nothing interesting to say. Choice Specs for its item, and Terra Steel for its, well, Terra, and you have heard everything you need to know about it. So, hopefully alcohol can say something about Azumarill while I drink some alcohol to drink away the pain of making this stupidly long video. That is it. If I don't get a 5% raise from this harassment, I will sue this entire server into the ground. Anyway, Azumarill is a mon that looks amazing on paper, and I thought this would be the case for a very long time. However, it's either too passive or has no relevant immunities, depending on what ability you use. And while its defensive stats are incredible, it can be chipped down easily by hazards, poison, and repeated attacks. If it doesn't have leftovers, it can't regain the health. Its typing is great in this tier, resisting three of the top five types with a potential immunity to a fourth, but it ends up being too passive, and there are usually better walls in the tier like Arboliva, Slacking, or Uxie. And if it runs huge power, it has the same attack stat as Ursaluna, which seems good, but without normal stab, Azumarill just doesn't end up hitting as hard as it really wants to. And here is another Pokemon we decided to rank in the list for no fucking reason. This pink petal plastic son of a plant has 154 special defense and nothing else going for it. The only reason this mod even got a use was because someone was smoking mass amounts of pot and decided, why don't we terrestrialize into a grass type so we can activate our shitty middling ability so we don't suffer from getting poisoned? What a genius idea! Why don't we send Flanders to NASA for his astronomically large cock, I mean brain he has? It'd almost work if the thing had any more than 78 base HP and 68 defense on a Pokemon where his main premise is to stall. Enough the ranting. It's not exactly a bad Pokemon in UU, thanks for this respectable 112 base special attack, but are you really going out your way to waste a Terra type and run choice specs on a Pokemon that realistically wouldn't be in the video if it wasn't for some high as fuck people deciding to use its shitty damn ability? Honestly, we're so far off the loony bin at this point, I reckon if there isn't a schizophrenic council member in the server, they are clearly doing their job wrong. That is actually not that bad of a point, Spice. I know, it's a rarity for you. You can put away your boner now, alright? To get back to the topic though, Gothitelle is a slightly worse version of Wigglytuff. The only difference now is that it has the Psychic Typing, which is a lot less impressive than the Fairy Typing. It also has more Special Attack, I guess. What I'm even talking about though, there's genuinely nothing to add to this thing, so I'm just gonna move on. That is, uh, Shadow Tag didn't exist. Oh wait, Shadow Tag is banned, so Gothitelle is bad. Medicham hits harder than your drunken uncle on Independence Day. Oh wait, I've already used that joke. Outside of that though, it's frail and hits like a wet noodle on the special side. Oh wow, it's literally my Palma explanation again, but the ability slot now has to exist to make up for how bad its natural attack stat is. Yeah, Medicham is bad, don't use it, it's not even good in Yu Yu. But somehow, we found an even worse Pokemon. Grafii has a really interesting niche. It's a poison touch user that can attack with an extremely valuable normal type stab. Now, is this too specific to be even remotely usable? Well, of course it is, but it's at least something. Now let me explain why it's bad. It's frail. Yeah, that's it. I have nothing else to add, and I frankly don't want to bother at this point, so I won't. In that case, let's hope that Giratina776 will put more effort into writing about Sableye than I could. If Sableye had stats, it would likely be an a tier Pokemon. The Dark Ghost typing is arguably the best defensive typing in metronome battles. It has three immunities to Normal, Fighting, and Psychic, which are all fairly common attacking types in metronome battles. This combo gives our Gemstone-Eyed Goblin 
only one weakness, which is the fairy, the least commonly pulled type. It has a decent-ish ability for stall teams in stall, which allows it to take its turns at last, allowing for phasing and flinching to affect it, in order to conserve PP. Unfortunately for our bejeweled friend, Game Freak forgot to give this Pokemon stats. In this environment, if Stool is your ace in the hole trait that makes everyone want to use you, over the other ghost types which have stats, you need something better to work with nowadays. While it had some niches in the Stooler, Stoolier environment pre-home, after home it's not showing potential in Yu Yu, due to all the powerful attackers that have dropped there with it. Sableye's stats truly are horrendous. It might have three abilities, immunities, but it sure as hell doesn't resist anything. If Sableye isn't immune, it's probably taking 40%, possibly more. Blissey is extremely outclassed no you. As a bulky normal type, slacking is just better. In that case, Blissey has to compete with Slack Off, where it's worse. Yeah, Slack Off is more physically bulky than Blissey, therefore making it better. I honestly wish I could make this shit up. Granted, in terms of taking special hits, nothing is better. Chugging that Lepaberry is the final thing you need to do, and you've just created a theoretical niche for something that shouldn't have one. Terra Ghost makes it immune to all physical normal moves, by the way, which makes it more optimal. Terra Steel doesn't even matter, since Natural Cure will remove your status conditions anyway. Granted, you really shouldn't Terra something as bad as Sit and OU. As such, I'm going to give the mic to someone who isn't even a council member, but wants to speak on Blissey's place in UU. Take it away, Lilith. Unlike in OU, in UU Blissey is unrivaled in its ability to waste everyone's time. Thanks to natural cure and absurd HP and special defense stats, Blissey only fears strong physical moves, which are much rarer due to the lower power level. While Blissey's pre-evolved form Chansey is technically bulkier, Blissey is able to hold leftovers or Lepaberry to further increase its longevity. Blissey's offensive stats are also slightly less terrible than Chansey's. While it definitely doesn't fit onto every team, Blissey has a clear niche in UU, and only in UU. Finishing off with the very best Pokemon for last, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I just wanted to talk about Azelf so I can absolutely bash the shit out of Iron Valiant. Azelf's in a weird case with Late Guardian Trio where it's just not good enough to sustain constant hits, but it's good enough to dish him out. At least that's what I would be saying if it didn't constantly explode. Explosion sound effect. Uh, editor's note, please make sure you add the explosion sound effect. Uh, thank you very much, Aid. You're a furry. I was going to add the sound effect, but then he said that. Fuck you. <laughs> Also, Iron Valiant is best girl. I'm telling you, Iron Valiant is best girl. I've taken way too many steroids today. In all seriousness, though, no, Azelf shares the same ability, Levitate, which is still a game changer if you're struggling heavily on spikes in the field, and if your poison type decides to final gambit for no reason whatsoever. Azelf's 125 base special attack allows it to match the likes of Arbor and Gardevoir in special attack. This also makes it optimal as a choice Bexmon, being second only to Hatterene in that usability. Otherwise, everything in its purposes are either vastly similar or inferior to Oxy and Mesprit, although if you give this thing a proportion of Grimace Shake, then it's not making it out alive. Honestly, the script is so old, I had to update this thing from like six years ago. Like, fuck me. <laughs> now here's the part you've all been waiting for. One of the big differences between a fairly mediocre Pokemon and a failure can all be part of its typing. Azelf has an alright type in overall, and Levitate helps to give it another immunity. However, Iron Valiant has arguably a worse type than a Pokemon like Weavar. Don't believe me? How about I sludge bomb your entire family? Not feeling so competent now, are you? All jokes aside, Iron Valiant doesn't exactly hit as hard as it really should do, all things considered, and having at least 3 to 4 Pokemon at the very least do its job better in both categories makes me believe how bad Iron Valiant is as a Pokemon. Aids is riding this thing's meat harder than a Taylor Swift stand. Like, for the 8,000th time, for fuck's sake, to pimp a butterfly by Kendrick Lamar is a far superior album to 1989. Like, do you not absolutely appreciate the masterpiece known as the Black of the Berry? Shake my fucking head! <sighs> okay, calm, Spice. Let's finish the fucking video. I'm getting sidetracked again. Azov doesn't bolster as many weaknesses, with it bolstering two less weaknesses compared to the 5 Iron Valiant has. Furthermore, have I already gone over the Spike's immunity part? That's a big difference here. 
Best time, probably Choice Band or Choice Bex, whichever one you prefer. Best Terror type, probably Terror Ghost. I think if you can make anything and everything out of a form of haunt, then you probably should be doing that. Best Buy, Best Buy Company, or Incorporated, is an American multinational consumer electronics retailer headquartered in Richfield, Minnesota. Originally founded by Richard M. Schultz and James Wheeler in 1966 as an audio special... Light switch. Let us know, um, make sure you sort the light switch out, please. Like, um, have like a fade to black screen or some... Actually, no, instant cut to black screen or some shit like that. To make sure that, um, there's a smoother transition to the, like, outro part. Like, the Patreon part. Peace. So, with over 50 paragraphs of bad takes from six assholes who desperately need to go outside, we finally have a conclusion to this future-length movie. I have mixed feelings about this video. Granted, they're not in terms of quality. If this isn't my magnum opus, then I may just give up on making videos entirely. What I mean is that this video was extremely long. It took a level of effort that I don't want to ever put in again. And it kinda soured how fun and unique the process of making it was. For as much as I dislike Discord, the process of writing the script in a call with the same people who helped shape the tier made this video a lot more fun to make, and is the only reason I decided to finish it at all. As such, I want to give a heavy thanks to Spice Giratina776, Torkin Peter, Alcohol, and Flanders for helping me with this beast of a script. The video couldn't exist without your help. It also couldn't exist without my extremely sexually attractive patrons. Those are my NFE patrons Mystic Owl, Filthy Cubone, and Jesse, along with my OU patrons Reggie Mania, J3 Puffin, Eternum, Torkin Peter, Yoshi64, and Ghoul, with the sexiest of them all being my $25 patron Plasma Energized. Actually, I'm gonna have to be a bit more fun here. I've been avoiding screaming for months, but I'm finally gonna scream the things you're not allowed to scream. Alright, I'm gonna say it. In three, two, one. Uh, let me increase the volume of my microphone real quick. All right. Plasmized! Ah! <laughs> Fuck my chest hurts now. <laughs> <laughs> Now that the rest of the council left the building, I can say my biggest, and in my opinion, best hot take. This one is that you should never use Terra in Metronome OU, because you should not think when you play this meta and clicking any button other than Metronome is for losers, so stay cool and ban Terra. Oh shit, uh, sorry Zorko, I just woke up. I just had a hangover the way the script turned out. I'd like to thank everyone for sticking around to the very end. If you're still watching this, feel free to comment Hatterina's heart for the funny algorithm, as we can't do shit like this without you. Anyways, I've had a lot of shit on my mind lately, talk on. What do you believe was the best part about the video? I liked pinging every council member to get in the VC and finish their script. Other than that, I liked how making this video made me research the individual mensch to such a ridiculous degree as it helped me understand the meta better. Honestly, I agree. The absolute madness that would happen just from telling the entire council the way they're asked up to write like four lines in the space of six hours is funny as hell. I'm also surprised this video was even finished within this year to be quite honest, as if I can recall properly, this script is roughly 16,500 words. Regardless, this was one hell of a journey, and I'm glad to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, thanks again Talker for helping out, and to you, the viewer, my friend, thank you for watching. Peace.